want to welcome you all to this uh, fantastic evening of awards, wits, and performances. Over the next hour and a half, you're going to have a chance to see some award-winning pieces performed to you by our very own Speech and Debate team. A little fun facts and trivia, our Speech and Debate team is actually the oldest team on campus, going all the way back into the 1920s, just after MKC was founded. We've got a bunch of stuff and newspapers up in the squad room that shows how we used to have a bit of a rivalry because we were one of the first junior colleges to come out and actually compete against the four-year schools. It's actually kind of funny because at one point Berkeley got kind of ticked off at us because we were showing up as a junior college and we were beating them and they decided that they were going to change how debate worked where we weren't going to have winners and losers anymore because it was kind of embarrassing and constantly used to us. I'm fortunately proud to say that that tradition is live and well. We just got back from our opening tournament of the, of the <coughs> season where we pretty much wiped the floor with everybody, including Berkeley at that point, taking a first base to play sweepstakes award at it. Much picking up. Yeah! Before we get started tonight, I just want to do a couple uh, round of thank yous. First off, I want to thank you all for coming out and giving up your uh, your evening to check out this performance. Excited to see you here. I know many of you are doing this as part of a class requirement, so just so that you know, we want to make sure if you're in a con class, you have one of these fancy critique forms, and that you fill this puppy out, you staple your ticket to it, and you bring it to your professor next time you see them. That will count as your proof of attendance for this evening. Um, in addition to thank you, I want to give a big thanks to my division, Arts, Humanities, and Communication, without some fantastic support staff and fellow faculty members. I would not have such an awesome forensics team to, uh, to coach. So we give a big round of applause. There we go. <laughs> Last, I want to give a big thank you to my support staff. I'm very fortunate to have a group of talented individuals that keep coming back and help me coaching. Um, Rob T uh, Taylor, who I had to leave already, um, is one of fantastic individuals that keeps coming back year after year to help me with Inter. I also want to give a little shout out to Tori Shin, who's been helping significantly with debate and some of our platforms. So give a big support for you. All right, before we dive into this evening, I want to take a moment to go ahead and introduce to you your speech and debate team. So I'm going to go ahead and call them up right now. Let's give them big rounds of applause. <laughs> Welcome, James Bob. Followed by Morgan Car Lauren Carteroff. Uh, followed up by Ephraim Kimura. Uh, next up is Megan Chatelaine. Katarina Grassi. Daniel Johnson. Tyrus Loveless. Sterling Mays. Rick Morris. Michael Rourke, John Solomon, Casey Shogun, Ronald Thompson, Daniel Wendell, and Stephanie Wolf. Ladies and gentlemen, your speech and debate team. All right, you're in for a heck of the show. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn the show over to our two MCs, Sterling and Paul. Take it away. Wow, what an amazing round of applause. All right. Okay. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and get this thing out of my face here and uh, kick it off with our first event. Our first event we got going on is called a Communication Analysis Speech. And that is done by Mr. John Song. Now, Sterling, why don't you tell everybody what a Communication Analysis Speech is? So, pretty much, it's also known as CA. Uh, pretty much, you take an informative, it's like an informative speech. We take it, also you take an artifact, a rhetorical artifact, and you apply a lot of theories to it. And once you flesh out the theories, it becomes more of a in depth in informative speech. So pretty much, yeah, it's pretty much the most detailed form of an informative you're probably going to get. Okay, a little bit about the guy doing this, uh, Mr. John Solomon. Huh? Wonder Bread? He is Wonder Bread on our team because he's so white and superhero-like. He also has some of the best hair on the team and he did amazing in San Francisco this weekend. So let's give him a big round of applause and we'll for that. City that never sleeps. If you were to think of New York City right now, you'd probably think of Broadway musicals, Yankees games, and for some reason those taxi cars that just seem to just miss you. For most of us, that would be the experience. For other women, and for most women, however, something else comes to mind. Street harassment. This is what popular New York City art artist Tatiana Filosia experience every day. Whistles, cat calls, and demands to give her harassers a smile. Eventually, she had decided that she had had enough. But addressing street harassment is complicated. In a 2014 article, Demanding Civility with Grit and Pace, author Felicia Lee explains that while the impacts of street harassment are clear, fear, distrust, shame, there's no form of legal ramification for this type of offensive speech. So people like Tatiana Velasco must take it into their own hands, literally. Equipped with posters, paste, and step ladders, Tatiana Kislasia began a street art campaign to bring women's unsmiling faces to the public sphere. Tatiana's first act in this endeavor was a stony faced self portrait with the caption, Stop Telling Women to Smile, which would eventually become the name of her campaign altogether. Today, we are here to analyze this campaign. To do so, we must ask the following research question How does the Stop Telling Women to Smile campaign interrupt the dominant discourse of street harassment? To answer this question, we will be first investigating what the Stop Telling Woman to Smile campaign is, second, unpacking the theoretical toolkit through Rebecca Jones' 2009 work on image events, and finally, using this model to draw the theoretical implications behind this campaign. First, let's investigate the Stop Telling Woman to Smile campaign. After Tatiana drew her self portrait, she proceeded to make copies of it, which she posted around the city specifically in areas where she had had memorable instances of street harassment. However, she was not done there. Tatiana began to interview more women, friends, family, even strangers, and hearing their stories. Based on each interview, Tatiana pairs the portraits with the messages women have for their harassers. All have a different story, but all share the same message, that they feel disrespected and shouldn't have to tell people that they don't owe them their time and aren't obligated to entertain them. According to a June 2014 article in The Guardian, Jessica Valenti writes that a national study shows that 65% of all women have experienced some form of street harassment. The most troubling part about this is that most proposed solutions to this problem emphasizes the role of the woman to protect herself instead of actually calling on the harassment. Thus, Velocity's art offers a unique response to the discourse of street harassment and has offered women an important platform in the public sphere. Second, let's look towards the rhetorical model. In the aesthetics of protest using image to challenge this one, author Rebecca Jones from the University of Tennessee looks at a movement called the Clothesline Project. This movement featured t-shirts designed by the survivors of domestic violence to help express their experiences. The t-shirts were then publicly displayed on the clothesline. This served as a form of visual rhetoric to literally air the dirty laundry of domestic violence. <coughs> We can look at this rhetorical typology developed by Rebecca Jones to understand how this and other similar visual protests function in response to dominant discourse. Jones identifies three criteria. The first tenet is embodiment. This means that the protest in some way must embody the experiences of the participants. The Clothesline Project clearly illustrates this by bringing to mind the men and women who have actually, metaphorically, 
one of these experiences. The second way it actually embodies this type of experience is that sometimes the, the actual shirts themselves show the pictures of the participants. The second tenet is polyvocalism. This means that the rhetorical artifact should it reflect the individual voices, perspectives, and experiences of the participants, even as they contribute to a larger commentary on the issue. The Close Line Project is called Vogel because the t-shirts are individually designed, designed to reflect different experiences before becoming a part of a larger display. The third tenet is that the protest must exist as a part of a larger network while simultaneously being grounded in the local. The Closed Arm Project illustrates this criteria. The project is a part of a larger, larger network because it's been carried out in multiple cities. However, while universal themes emerge in the designs, every article of clothing is unique, and each project reflects the community of the individuals involved. Finally, we can use this triangulated model to analyze how the Stop Telling Woman's Mouth campaign as a form of visual rhetoric. Tatiana of the Lossia Street posters meet the first tenet of embodiment in two ways. First, each poster depicts the actual faces of the women she has interviewed. Their faces are prominently featured, staring at a passerby. The unamused expressions of the women is important in challenging the dominant discourse that women should become more appealing and less intimidating by smiling. <laughs> Second, the placement of the posters is a form of embodiment. Most of the posters are hung in spaces around the city that women have actually stood themselves, spaces formerly dominated by their harassers. If the street harassment is a form of intrusion on the woman's space, the art campaign can be a way for women to reclaim the space as their own. However, the campaign is complicated. In attempting to challenge dominant discourse, the portraits may simultaneously reaffirm it by painting women as silent figures to be observed by individuals on the street. Each poster is a fragment of a larger argument, but the critique is only effective if the viewer actually sees the whole. In addition to visual embodiment, Stop, the Stop Telling Women Smile campaign is polyvocal. At least on face, Velocia interviews each woman individually, not only to hear her story, but to hear how she would respond to the harasser given the chance. Those responses accompany images and captures captions saying, My outfit is not an invitation, and women do not owe you their time or conversation. Though the women are featured individually, their pictures and voices become a part of a larger force when partnered with all the other women's posters within the city. However, the campaign may not be truly polyvocal. Unlike the Clothesline Project, the women featured in Velocity's art aren't directly involved. Beyond giving an initial interview and having a photo taken, they have no say or no initial design in their own posters. Rather, Velocity is the one who reinterprets their experiences and also repackages it. Finally, Velocity's art is both a part of a larger network and grounded in the local. What started out as a local, personal protest for Velocity has become an internationally recognized movement. Anita Little explains in her 2014 article of these walls could talk that Velocity has actually made enough through a Kickstarter campaign to be able to ship her posters to over 10 cities internationally and domestically. However, Velocity's art, art exists in the digital world. The close sign project of the 90s function as a satellite for the public. This is a term developed by Catherine Squires in her 2002 article, Rethinking the Black Public Sphere, to describe publics that maintain separation were a part of a larger public discourse. <coughs> the Close Sign Project stayed grounded in a local context, but the internet has allowed Velocity's art to go viral. These digital connections have blurred the lines between localities and the individual counterpublics into one. What makes this problematic is this. As we saw in Occupy Wall Street, when counterpublics become popularized on the internet, they tend to lose their ability to protect their development of discourse. This is because they can be co-opted, altered, and reframed by the masses. So did they? We propose the following research question. How does the Stop Telling Women to Smell campaign interrupt the dominant discourse of street harassment? We first looked at the background behind this campaign then unpack a theoretical toolkit through Jones' analysis of the Bozine project, and finally, perform some analysis and drew some critical implications. As we look back to the research question, we can see that there is some efficiency in the ways that the Stop Telling Women the Smile campaign interrupts patriarchal norms. However, it is a complicated <coughs> campaign. These, there may be some problems with the way it unintentionally reinforces the very discourse it seeks to disrupt. 
Future scholars should investigate the intersections between visual rhetoric and the means by which it challenges problematic discourse. So the next time you're in Hebrew, whistle for the cat, <laughs> but not the woman passing by. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that riveting speech about telling women not to smile. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, so next event we got coming on is a persuasive speech done by Katarina Grassi. Now, tell us, Mr. Know-It-All, what is a persuasive mm -hmm. speech? Well, pretty much what a persuasive speech is, you take a controversial topic and you argue whether you agree with it or you disagree with it, and you come up with solutions on how to fix the problem or how there's no way you can really fix it. So pretty much, yeah, it's pretty much a simple way of saying, yeah, we're trying to persuade our audience. Our audience. <laughs> so we're yeah, to Yes, Katarina is here, and she is... Hey, hi. All right, so she did very well at our opening tournament this year and <coughs> took a top novice out of all the rest of the schools. So why don't we go ahead and give her a big round of applause.
25 years. Throughout the years, she has had seven children, all victims of a mitochondrial disease. All but one, the fourth, passed away hours after being born. Her fourth child, Edward, lived to be 21. Had she had the help of mitochondrial replacement in vitro fertilization, her children would not have suffered. By legalizing mitochondrial replacement IVF, future generations will be less likely to have a mitochondrial disease. According to Professor Doug Turnbull of the University of Newcastle, in his 2000 article published in the Trenton Genetics Research Journal, mitochondrial DNA is inherited solely from the maternal side. Meaning, if a mother's false mitochondria is swapped with a donor's healthy mitochondria, the embryo will be healthy and free of mitochondrial mutation. If the child is male, the free gene DNA will stop with the child. If the child is female, her offspring will continue to be free of mitochondrial mutation since she will be passing on the healthy mitochondrial DNA. This technique also allows for prospective parents to not be prevented from having children simply because they are a carrier of the mitochondrial disease. There is an ethical imperative that women carrying these diseases be offered this technique as a way to prevent the transmission of mitochondrial DNA disease to their offspring. Marty Folk, a mitochondrial specialist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, states in her 2009 article published in the Trend and published in the current treatment options in neurology that there is an enormous drive to reproduce. That's just within us. It is unethical to tell carriers of mitochondrial disease that they simply shouldn't have that drive or desire. By legalizing this thing, <coughs> would-be mothers around the world are able to have a child of their own genetic DNA without the psychological distress that they won't be that they will be passing on in the terrible disease. Mitochondrial replacement idea has proven safe in many trials on animals. An August 2010 article titled The Transmission of Mitochondrial DNA Diseases and Ways to Prevent Them states that recent experiments on my Recent experiments on animals show that mitochondrial replacement holds future promise. In 2009, a study was conducted on primate insects to determine the effectiveness of mitochondrial gene replacement. Michelle Sparman, along with her colleagues, concluded in a study published in the September 17, 2009 issue of Nature Science Journal that the primate oocytes with the mitochondrial gene replacement were capable of supporting normal fertilization embryo development and produce healthy offspring. Sparman also notes that this technique offers a reproductive approach for, for preventing transmission of mitochondrial DNA diseases in affected families. These experiments have also been performed on bovine and bi sites, all of which had the same positive effects. Mutation free. Mitochondrial replacement idea allows for a devastating genetic disorder to essentially be eradicated. However, some individuals fear the worst and refuse to open their minds to, a, to this new technique, which has the potential to save the lives of future generations. The fear that we will be playing God is one that has been around since the introduction of traditional idea, and it's now rose to the top of concerns again. CNN news anchor Brooke Baldwin states in her 2014 interview with Dr. Alan Copperman, people are watching. They're thinking, great, I'd love to have a healthy baby. But there could come a day when a parent says, hmm, you know, I kind of like the idea of brunette, tall, blue eyes. Can we make that baby happen? I mean, how do we make sure that doesn't happen? That we don't play God? The fact is, according to the Northeast England Stem Cell Institute in their 2009 Nature Science Journal article, mitochondrial DNA which is the only genetic material being altered by this technique, encodes just 37 of the 22,000 genes, or less than 0.002% of the entire human genome. These genes exist outside the nucleus for the purpose of programming mitochondria to provide energy to cells and do not, in, do not affect any other cellular or bodily function normally associated with identity and character. The opposition's greatest fear is what the media has begun to refer to as designer babies. 
John LaCoupe, Chief Medical Correspondent of the CBS Evening News with Scott Healy, states, we're starting out with a technique meant to prevent a devastating illness. But some people are worried that this technique can be used to create so-called designer babies, kids who are more intelligent, who have other qualities parents find desirable. Some people are worried that this technique will create a genetically modified line of humans with supposedly superior qualities. They are worried about the concept referred to as eugenics. However, according to Dr. Dieter Haley of the New York Stem Cell Foundation, this is impossible with mitochondrial replacement idea. The mitochondrial DNA, mitochondrial DNA replacement cannot guarantee any traits, superior or otherwise. Except if it works as planned, the absence of mitochondrial disease. Eagley states in the 2014 New York Times article titled The Brave New World of Three Parent Idea that rather than open the door to eugenics, we might in fact be opening the door to curing many other degenerative diseases, such as diabetes, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's. The being a mitochondrial replacement in vitro fertilization should be replaced with regulation, which allows for it to be researched and used for medicinal purposes. By legalizing this technique, future generations will be less likely to have a mitochondrial disease. Just a simple swap of DNA. Just a simple swap of mitochondria. 0.002% of the entire human genome. And would-be parents are able to have a child that they otherwise would not be able to have. A child free of mitochondrial disease. This technique, which has proven safe in many trials on, on animals, allows for a devastating genetic disorder to essentially become obsolete. This is our chance to eliminate a drastic life-shortening disease. Do your part by signing the mitochondrial replacement IVF petition on wethepeople.gov to revoke the ban and allow for children like Alana Saarinen to live their lives to the fullest. <coughs> Let's start working for a better tomorrow. A tomorrow free, a mitochondrial. Anyways, <laughs> our next event coming up is a dramatic interpretation done by our good old pal Rick Morris. So tell us, what is a dramatic interpretation? So a dramatic interpretation is you take this piece of literature or a monologue and you give it life. And the only thing with the interpreter is that they have to use no props and they get uh, no costumes. So pretty much. They're using their voice and their body language to express some, some type of theme or some type of issue that is a that's socialist myth yet. And they try to display us through their interpretation. Through their interpretation. Um, other than that, dramatic interpretation is a lot of fun. All right, so a little bit about Rick Morris uh, at San Francisco uh, a couple of weekends back. Rick Morris took third place in this event, so hope you all enjoyed it. Let's bring up Rick Morris. <laughs> <laughs> you have never met a tougher man. And my father was most well known for being able to break the horse that couldn't be broken. I would sit out beside the table and listen as the stallion inside would bang against the walls and smash the doors and knock over bales of hay and rip open bags of feed. It was like there were explosions going on inside. And then my father would walk in with nothing but an apple in his hand. 
And for the first 5, 10, 15 minutes, the banging would go on, the pounding and the explosions. And then it would start to die down. And the banging would stop. And it would get quiet. And then my father would walk out, or would come out, on the back of the horse that no man could ride. It was like having Superman as your father. Diana Calatero and Robo Apagón Patero Tu. Translated from the Greek, means be a better man than your father. Much like Hector from Homer's Iliad, this is a universal human concept that many people struggle with today. The following piece argues that we can be better than those who raise us. My Father's Son by Matthew Dix. I spent my childhood trying to impress and earn the love of this superhero of a father. I remember we had this mean little pony named Flicker, and one day, Flicker reached out of the stall and bit me in the stomach. Dad, Flicker has me, he won't let go! And my father looked at me from underneath that hat and smiled. He's just got to go. And because it was my father, I grinned and bared it. Until Flicker let go, and then I reached up my shirt to show him the love. I don't think my father has ever been more proud of me than that moment. We used to play a game where my father would lie on his back on the dining room table with his arms outstretched and would stand in his hands and he would lift us up. And the one who could stay bound for the longest would win. And if you were lucky when you fell, you'd fall into his chest and he'd grab you and hold you tight. And if you were unlucky, you'd tip to the left or the right and hit the dining room table. <laughs> And if you're really unlucky, you bounce off the dining room table and onto the floor or into the wood pile next to the wood burning stove. <laughs> now it sounds like negligent parenting, <laughs> even by 1970 standards. <laughs> it was a great time to be a kid. One day, I got off the school bus and I went into the house. And my mother was sitting there on the couch next to some man. And he said that his name was Mr. McKenna, and he was there to help us, because our parents were getting divorced. And just like that, my life changed. The cowboy hat was gone, the boots were gone, the belt buckles were gone. Within a week, the horses were gone from the stable. And my father was gone. In about 14 seconds after my parents' divorce was finalized, my mother remarried, and she became Mrs. McKenna. And that social worker, Mr. McKenna, Neil, became my stepfather. And I had this other man that I had to impress, and he was nothing like my father. He wore white shirts and paisley ties, drank wine and vodka instead of beer. And Neil? liked everything that his real son, Ian, liked. Ian was a baseball player, so I decided I would become a baseball player too. But my family never had any money. So they gave me a hand-me-down baseball club for a right-handed player. And I'm left-handed. Hmm. So even though Ian is three years younger than me, he was playing in Bay Bridge. I was in farm But even when my farm league team made it to the championship and I was named an all-star, Neil never came to a game. I tried everything I could to impress Neil, to make him like me. I improved my grades, I tried to help out the family, and I got a job at a farm and gave him the money. And money was always a problem in the family. And my mother and Neil thought about it all the time. I remember this one time, just before Christmas, my mother and Neil were fighting in the kitchen. And Neil was saying there wasn't going to be any Christmas because we didn't have enough money. So I gathered up my brothers and sisters and we went into the basement and started picking the tinsel off of last year's Christmas tree and ironing it out. 
thinking that if we could get the tinsel and they didn't have to buy that, we could put out Christmas. But nothing I did was ever good enough for that man. <coughs> and then one day, my mother and Neil were fighting in the kitchen again. And Neil was saying that he was going to leave my mother. But when he left, she was going to lose the house. And she wasn't going to be able to feed us anymore. She was going to be alone and penniless. And I couldn't take it anymore. I was 15 years old. So I strode into the kitchen across the dining room table. And I looked at him. Be a man! And he looked at me. Mind your own business. Go to your room. So I did. When I got to my room, I slammed the door shut as hard as I could. And the whole house shook. I got far from the stallion. And then I heard him coming. And I knew he was coming for me. So I stood in the middle of my bedroom and I waited for him. And he came in. He threw open the door and I said, What? And I got about halfway through that word before he hit me. He didn't punch me. He didn't slap me. He backhanded me and it sent me to the ground. But I was not going to let him put me to the ground. So I stood back up and I said, why don't you hit me again? And he did. Twice as hard. When I hit the ground, I was seeing stars. I was my father's son, damn it. I had fallen off of horses and dining room tables. I was not going to let him keep me down, so I started to get back up. And Neil knew it. He knew me. So he hit me before I could get to my feet. And this time I wasn't getting back up. So he stood over me. What? I had nothing to say. So he turned me on. And as I lay there on my bedroom floor, I swore to myself, but I made a promise that in three years I will graduate high school, I will leave this house, and I will never see or speak to that man again. And I kept my promise. When I turned 18, I left. And Neil kept his promise too. Two years after I left, he left my mother. After not paying the mortgage for over a year uh, and not telling uh -huh. her, so the bank foreclosed upon the house, and she was penniless, mm. just like you promised. Mm. I kept my promise for 17 years until my mom died, and I was at the wake, standing in that line, shaking hands, and listening to people tell me how sorry they were. Before I knew it, I was shaking this hand, and I look up, and it was Neil. He looked back at me. So sorry to hear your mom pass. For a minute, I didn't even know who it was. And then I remembered, and I realized, and I thought to myself, I am 35 years old. I can hit him the way that he had hit me that day. I knew that I was old enough to know better and to not get him the way he should have known way back when. Yeah. Well, that was depressing. <laughs> Let's move uh, away from that. So, <laughs> so our next event is an impromptu speech done by our good friend here, Ron Thompson. He's not supposed to be here yet, but he's here. So okay. Yeah, we're going wrong. I see you. Okay. Yeah, just back up. Yeah, I see you. All right. So, certainly, what is an impromptu speech? So in prom two, you practically have two minutes to prepare a five-minute speech, depending on what three quotations you get or three words you get. Sometimes it might be bladder. That's, uh, that's a word you get sometimes. Or it'll be a random quotation. So we usually give them two minutes to prep, and they give us a random five-minute speech. So a little bit about the person doing this. Uh, Ron Thompson took a finalist award at 
Yeah, at uh, the event in San Francisco, because I can't speak firmly. So, let's go ahead and give him a good round of applause so we can get this combobulated. Who made that man, Gunner? I did, sir. He's my cousin. Who is that? He's an asshole, sir. I know that. What's his name? That is his name. Major Asshole. How many assholes do we have on the ship? Your hood! I knew it. I'm surrounded by assholes. <laughs> this iconic scene from the 1980s cult classic, Spaceballs, shows where Dark Helmet refuses to set the proper foundation and instead of having a proper crew, decides to go for a ship full of assholes. And this all brought me to the quotation I received today. The secret of getting ahead is getting started by Mark Twain. I'm going to interpret this as you must first lay the foundation. And I agree with this interpretation because without setting the groundwork, you're doomed to fail. And I'm going to show this through three main points of a famous journalist, a mathematical theory, and finally, a book. So, breaking news into our first point of Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite, at age 23, joined the United <laughs> Press Association and began to report on World War II. He was one of the very few journalists allowed to report on the D-Day invasion in Normandy. After World War II, he began to work for the, he decided to get into the risky and uncertain field of TV news where he became the CBS Evening uh, Anchor. Walter Cronkite had a couple of values that he had to bring to this new uh, uncharted territory of television news. His idea of the get the facts fast, keep them correct, and also educate his audience. His integrity in his journalistic skills using these facts was, uh, in one instance, uh, he waited 40 full minutes before announcing that Pre President Kennedy had been assassinated because he wanted to make sure that he had all the facts in before making a wrong decision. This, in, uh, this integrity that Walter Cronkite set, uh, set the groundwork for future journalists to follow in his footsteps, to get the facts right and not just rush out there and get, get them wrong, <coughs> but also to educate his audience at the same time. Now, getting crazy into the next point of chaos theory. The French mathematician in, 1980, in 19, or sorry, 1880s, by the name of Henry of Pion Curie, Curie, came up with the idea that the present determines the future. Or simply put, uh, small effects have huge outcomes in the future. 
However, this theory wasn't very much useful at the time until the 1950s when they started to use it for trying to predict weather models, where small uh, meteorological uh, instances in the <coughs> atmosphere uh, were to create huge things, such as warmer air in the Sahara ended up creating hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico. We can see that by laying the groundwork early on, Henry Pion Curie allowed our modern day uh, weathermen to only get the weather wrong some of the time. So splicing into my third point of the Atlantis series. In the Atlantis series you have two warring alien races. You've got the Serpentine Alliance, which if you Star Trek fans are out there, they're kind of like the Borg, where they try to assimilate every species known. Then we also have the Atlanteans, who are warring against the Serpentine Alliance. The leader of the Atlanteans is General Ares, where he comes to Earth 70,000 years ago and begins to splice in genetic information into the emerging human genome. So better prepare the humans against the oncoming uh, Serpentine invasion. Later on, the Serpentine Alliance comes and invades Earth, and the humans are, are resistant against the Serpentine Alliance because General Ares set the groundwork early on so that way humans could be resilient <coughs> and successful. So wrapping up, we've talked about Walter Cronkite and how his integrity led for, or his integrity in journalism allowed future journalists to follow in his footsteps. We talked about uh, chaos theory and how Henry Pion Curie set the groundwork so that way our modern day uh, weathermen can now predict the weather. And then we talked about the Atlantis series where, where General Ares set the groundwork in the human genome so that way we can be better protected against the Serpentine Alliance. And this all brought me to a quotation I received today, The Secret of Being Ahead is Getting Started by Mark Twain. And remember, in Spaceballs, Having a ship full of assholes is a terrible <laughs> foundation. Thank you. Thank you, Ron, for that speech and getting the word assholes. Now for a, another speech that's actually entertaining. Jeez. Oh, man. We have an after dinner speech. <laughs> We have an after dinner speech coming up, performed by James Boss. So, Sterling, why don't you tell us what an after dinner speech is? Well, an after dinner speech is practically you take a persuasive or an informative topic, topic and you make it funny. So, we take you take something and take it to the extreme, to a point. But pretty much, it's more of an advanced version of a uh, persuasive or an informative. All right, a little bit about uh, James Boss. He finalized at San Francisco uh, in this event. And he's a very good speaker and a good friend of mine, and hopefully he won't be terrible at this. So let's go ahead and give a, a bit of a round of applause to James Bond. Well. It's important to have a strong self-concept. Know thyself has been my motto for a long time. But recently I've found myself in an existential quandary. The type of thing that makes you want to curl up on the floor in a ball and weep as you contemplate your pitiful, meaningless existence. Oh. <laughs> you see, recently I was told that I am a terrorist. I know, right? I have no idea. <laughs> but according to some report by the Department of Defense last access on September 15, 2014, my membership at Sequoia Heights Baptist Church qualifies me as a religious extremist. Now, don't mistake my meaning. I do consider getting up at 7 a.m. on a Sunday morning to pour myself into a suit and then listen to my pastor drone on for hours to be pretty extreme. But, for honestly, when was the last time you heard about a white guy being accused of wanting to topple the government? Except maybe President Bush. <laughs> <laughs> the sad thing is my quandary is just one example of a trend in this country that's causing a growing divide between religion and society. Christians. Now, Christianism is the term used to describe people who use the label of Christianity to push super far-right ideals, even when they don't line up with actual biblical teachings. These are the Christian who cry wolf types, who every time they don't get their way, it's the newest flavor of religious oppression. Help, help, I'm being oppressed. Come see the religious intolerance inherent within the system. 
<laughs> this disconnect between biblical teachings and its followers is causing some pretty big problems in society. I think Gandhi said it best. I like your Christ. I just don't like your Christians. So today, we're going to figure out how to part this troubled sea of religion by first figuring out the problems that are happening within Christianism, then by looking at the causes, before finally seeking divine guidance as we attempt to find the one true path to a solution. For as we all know, as it says in the scriptures, and Mark said it unto Luke, thou shalt have a pass. Oh, sorry guys. That was the St. Mary Jane translation. <laughs> I bet. Now, before you guys start saying, hey, Christians aren't persecuted, and the only thing you guys have ever lost is the right to put witches on trial, I'd like to remind you that you don't see witches just walking around hexing people, do you? You don't. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but there are some pretty serious problems here, and we're going to delve into this by first looking at the influence of Christianism on politics, and then by seeing the suppression of religious moderates and liberals. Now, the influence of Christianism on politics is easy to see. You can't really throw a rock in Congress without it hitting something being influenced by the Christian far right. Huffington Post reported on December 24, 2013, that Christianists constantly use the power that comes with their label to push abusive societal reforms on groups that already get consistently marginalized. No choice for women? Can I hear a hallelujah? <laughs> Banning gay marriage by constitutional amendment? Amen. <laughs> voter IDs that can, in, in voter IDs that inherently exclude minority voters? Oh, preach it, brother. <laughs> On top of this, Christianists have become so entrenched in their mindset that they're completely unwilling to budge or compromise with people in other political positions. Christianists muscle out other people's opinions like they were Ray Rice's girlfriend in an elevator. <laughs> <laughs> The big one. <laughs> oh, too soon. <laughs> well, yeah. I'd like to remind you that Christianists are the same group of people that attempted to block revisions to the Violence Against Women Act last year. I guess they wanted to get in on the whole Sharia law thing. <laughs> the second problem we need to look at is the suppression of religious moderates and liberals. Now, when most people hear the word Christian, they think of one set of beliefs and ideals. But in reality, Christians represent a multifaceted group of people whose opinions populate the entire political spectrum. All Christians are different. Some are Macs, some are PCs, and some believe the computer is a soul-stealing portal to hell. <laughs> Huffington Post reported on March 11, 2013, that religious moderates and liberals are consistently ignored by the media and by the powers in DC. This isn't a problem for ultra-conservative Christians, who as we all know are virtually always on the news and consistently influencing politics. This has a two-pronged effect on the Christian community. It affirms Christianness, but it also causes everyone else to distance themselves from the issues altogether. Why? Because when Christianists influence a decision that society may disagree with, such as Hobby Lobby, society has a tendency to blame all Christians, even those who disagree with the decision. As a leading fundamentalism article said on May 2nd, 2012, when you take a sledgehammer to fundamentalism, moderates still get hit by the shards. This type of thinking always has collateral damage, much like how Hobby Lobby employees are now forced to craft their own contraceptives from sequins, wood glue, and a pine car derby. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about hitting a woody. <laughs> now that we've exposed the problem, we need to expose the closet. Like that one guy exposes all those celebrity dudes he stole from the outside. Stay strong, Jay Law. You're looking good. <laughs> the causes we're going to talk about today are media bias and what's known as stereotype threat. Now, the media plays a huge role when it comes to the assumptions we make about people, but they have every incentive to only show us sensationalized opinions to boost their news viewing stats. I mean, think about it. Who wants to hear a rational discussion about religion when you can hear about the Christian who thinks Congressman Frank Lucas was executed in 2011 and has since been a body dump? Really, this guy exists. Huffington Post reported the story on June 24, 2014. You guys should read about it. <laughs> now, this is important to take note of because as a society, we are inclined to believe that what's true about one member in a group is true about all the members of the group. This is what's known as the outgroup homogeneity effect. In his December 2nd, 2012 report, Dr. Mark Rubin explains that we're inclined to believe everyone in a specific outgroup is the same, while our in-group is diverse. 
This means that when we only see the ultra-conservative Christian opinion in the media, we think that is what it means to be Christian. And we just reaffirm Christianists as the group with all the influence. So thank you, conservative media outlets like Fox News, where the long-standing business model has been, I reject your reality and substitute my own. <laughs> now the second cause we need to talk about is what's known as stereotype threat. Last updated, August 23rd, 2013, Education Reform Glossary defines stereotype threat as the tendency of people to become the negative assumptions made about them. Basically, stereotypes are self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, this trend was discovered after a study in which black college students performed worse on exams after being told of a stereotype before the test of a, yeah, of a stereotype that black college students tend to test poorly. Now, I would make a joke about this, but I don't think I'm allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> Someone gets it. <laughs> now, this trend is evident in the Christian community. As we can see from the article, Pinfin may not be easy, but try being a moderate Christian, which is my favorite name of any article ever. The March 1st, 2012 report by Dr. James Henderson explains that if you aren't a super far right Christian, it's hard to maintain any degree of Christianity. You're pressured to either be all in or all out. And to answer your question, yes, that is what she said. <laughs> <laughs> now by now I'm sure some of you are thinking that the easiest way to spread actual biblical truths to Christians would just be to go all 50 shades of gray and make the book into a movie. <laughs> but honestly, I don't even think they'd go see it. Unless, unless we actually made it into a crossover. Fifty Shades of Christ <laughs> for the sinner's soul. <laughs> now luckily there are some non-cinema immediate solutions available to both Christians and society in general. Now the first solution is just for Christians, so if you're in here, listen up. Stop hating on people. <laughs> That's it. That's the whole first solution. Just do that in your book. <laughs> now the next solution is for the rest of Christians, and it's transparency. In his 2007 book, David Penniman explains that uh, transparency is the best tool a Christian has to overcome assumptions that might be stuck to him just because of his religious identity. It also says that transparency helps us be more accountable to ourselves about areas in our lives where we're not putting really forward an image for our faith. In an attempt to demonstrate this, I will be confessing to the entire list of sins I've committed today. <laughs> this morning, I swore at my debate partner when he woke me up two minutes before my alarm. Then, I swore at my alarm who woke me up after only two minutes of sleep. Earlier, when Rick was doing his depressing DI, I was super jealous of his cool little black book, while also angry at him for making me feel things. <laughs> and then finally, during my entire speech, I have been lusting after someone. Bad. <laughs> Doesn't matter, dude. <laughs> now, our last solution is for everyone, and it's remarkably simple. Communication. Talking to Christians and realizing that we're not all backpack crazy can help you realize that what's true about one member in our group is not true of all the members. We're all beautiful, unique snowflakes, guys. <laughs> so don't hate on me just for being cuckoo for Christ us. <laughs> now, according to the Australian, which is a newspaper, not just like some guy, <laughs> Last recorded on August 23rd, 2013, when you recognize the religious moderates and liberals of a group, you empower them, which is really the only way to reduce the influence from the extreme sides of the scale. Well, now that we've had our come to Jesus moment, I guess I should bring this thing to a close. Today we've learned about Christianism, the problems, the causes, and what steps we can take to prevent these problems from reoccurring. I guess at the end of the day, I do still have some soul searching to do. Although now that I'm on the no-fly list, the TSA seems more than happy to help me with that search. Hmm. On the bright side, I did make a new best friend in the form of Derek, the overeager searching attendant. <laughs> <laughs> I did learn a valuable lesson, though, guys. I guess some people do like Christians after all. Thank you for that ribbon.
limiting speech there, James. I do want to listen to you, but since we're a terrorist, I'm not going to. <laughs> that was good. All right, so our last event today is a parliamentary Lincoln Douglas debate between Megan Chatelaine and Casey Steve Long. So, what exactly is a parliamentary Lincoln Douglas debate? What do you mean you don't know? <laughs> it's your job. It's your only job. Why do you think we gave you those clothes? Do you want to go back to this? I don't think so. Hurry up. No comment. <laughs> Alright, so Lincoln Douglas debate is pretty much one on one where we have the resolution. Uh, they debate one resolution where one is the affirmative and one is the negative. Uh, where we have Casey as the affirmative and Megan as the negative. Um, practically, they're going to be arguing uh, over the... Oh, you want to describe this? Okay, so our resolution for today is that the state of California should legalize marijuana for recreational use. Alright, so for this, you guys must participate. Because if you hear a good argument, you would say, here, here. Come on, say it. Now, if you hear something that's just total crap, <laughs> so you can go, shame. 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 Um, also, there's, uh, <laughs> but, uh, so pretty much if you hear those arguments, if you feel, uh, feel like something was really, really good, go ahead and feel like knocking on your, uh, your chair. That always works too. Because you always want to support who has the better argument. Because in the end, we're going to vote. Who won? So, let's go ahead and we'll welcome up Casey and Megan. Woo! Woo! Ha, ha, ha. 
Through this plan, it will solve for the court clog of cases being processed that really have no place being in a court, and it will also increase the state funding because of the tax revenue. So the first advantage of this case is that we're getting a lot of money from this. So the first argument here is that after Colorado has legalized marijuana, they made $19.9 million in the first three months. So, and after the first 18 months, they made $184 million just in tax revenue. So this shows that when the plan passes, California will gain revenue through the sales of uh, marijuana. And so we will increase our taxes the same way Colorado has. This will... This will increase... Uh, yeah, it will increase the tax revenue that California gains. It will also decrease the amount of, that California is putting against the cases because they won't have to have those 13,000 cases that they're not having to not defend against since it will no longer be in the court. Uh, that's per year. So because of the increase in revenue in California, uh, California can increase its spending. Uh, California has kind of a pie chart on how they delegate their money. And right now, 20% of it is delegated towards ed education. So, just assuming that we have the same rate of people who partake in marijuana as Colorado, which, being that this is California, let's be honest, we probably have more. <laughs> we will have, uh, in 18 months, we should see $257,6.6 million going to just education. Also, we are reducing the amount of court fees by $11.7 million. Um, every single year. So through the plan, we are increasing the state revenue, we're increasing the education, and we're increasing everything throughout any kind of financial means. And that's why you're voting for the front today. Thank you. Court clock, where we don't have an exact number, but it should be around 13,000 cases, as that's how many right now are being put in the system a year. How are you going to regulate the amount of THC in the Um, We feel that the people themselves should be able to regulate their own THC, and so. <laughs> that's funny. Children harm. 
There's going to be a loss of education, which is actually, actually going to hurt our economy because these kids are not going to be in school to learn anything. Parents can't protect their children at school because you don't know exactly what they're doing during lunchtime. Not only that, but schools are more concerned about peanut butter allergies than marijuana being passed to these kids. On to his advantage, he talks about how there's this pie chart where we all know what's in that pie. So, <laughs> so let's, let's be realistic with that one. Since, I mean, pretty much our government can't balance any kind of budget, so we know what they're doing. <laughs> so pretty much his, his whole plan here is saying that, oh, this revenue is going to go towards education. We can't know that for sure. I mean, how many of us are actually sitting in there going, no, nah, we shouldn't really do that, but hey, your race is cool. <laughs> so, I mean, his whole plan here saying that he's just going to pass this is actually going to hurt our children because we can't protect them in schools, and that's why you're voting for the negative team. So how many uh, children have actually been kicked out of school because of the marijuana-related charge? I don't have an exact number, but it's 32% increase. Okay, and so then with the, you said that the plan doesn't work because they might not delegate there. But when they actually have a specific amount like that they're delegating through their pie chart that they have, that 20% will go to the children, where's your warrant saying that they won't go? Well, since we're not actually in their budgeting or with them balancing this budget, we can't say that this is actually going to happen. And history has shown that our government doesn't exactly spend money where it's of 32% if they don't know the numbers. That doesn't make any sense at all. Second one here is that a percentage can be completely misleading. If there's one problem child and now there's two, that's a 100% increase. Now that doesn't mean that there's a 100% more birth. That doesn't mean that there's now an epidemic of children running around creating havoc. It just simply <laughs> means that there's a 100% increase. Like, it doesn't actually mean anything. Uh, second is, the parents and children through the plan will have more money in the education system, and because of that, they'll be able to be more educated in order to prevent these ch children from doing these things. And the parents will be more educated as to where to store their edibles as my partner has. <laughs> so because of that, they will not have their edibles in a situation as to where these children can get it, and if the children did have it, they would realize the consequences of that. Furthermore, through the taxes, we're increasing not only the education, but we're also increasing the security portion of the pie chart. So because of that, the schools are actually going to be safer, and we'll be able to crack down on these problem children before they can spread their ideals to the other children and corrupt them all. <laughs> so through the plan, not only are we increasing in education, we're also increasing the safety of our schools. Now, looking at the, uh, where my opponent attacked my plan at, her only real argument against this is basically what's in the pie, and as I, as I pointed out, it's what the government spends on, that's what the laws say it mandates to do. Like, we have to put a certain amount of each dollar that we get away to certain things. Now, 20% is just the number I chose for education since we're here at a school. I thought education would be the best way to um, help this case along. Um, so that's, that's why I chose the education portion, but I could have just as easily chose the security portion or the road construction portion. But I thought education was more easier for us all to grasp. Uh, so what's in the pie chart? The, well, the, the answer is what the chart is. Uh, <laughs> uh, and we can't decide on how we're going to budget, uh, the government's going to do it. We can't choose how the government's going to actually budget their case. Well, that's not really... We already have to, and that's what the that's what all our bills are for. That's how we delegate where it goes. Like we elected these people to choose how it gets delegated. They delegate twenty percent of it to education. That's just how it works. There, there's no changing in that. 
Um, so by your argument saying it won't go to education, it will go to education, 20% of it will. And for those reasons, you're going to be voting for the affirmative today. Thank you. So he's claiming that my first disadvantage is fear tactics. Well, yeah, because parents should be worried about their kids doing pot on campus or in their own school. Um, so these kids aren't just getting these THC laced edibles from home, they're getting it from their friends, as I've said. So pretty much, what kid is going to turn down a candy bar or a brownie if they don't know it has drugs in it? They're just going to see this as a product. We've already said that Texas is even labeling these things to target children, so how are they going to go, oh man, that's not a Snickers bar, no way. <laughs> Even the best, most educated and informed parents cannot be with their kids 24 hours, so they're not going to know that they're doing this. So imagine that phone call to a parent at home saying, oh, I'm so sorry, Mrs. Cartman, but Eric's in the hospital because he ate a pop brownie from Kenny. <laughs> so, so when he says, oh, there's no real number, I've already told you that 32% of kids have risen and gotten expelled from this, so that is a number for you. Um, and with his whole advantage here, that Cal um, that he's... <laughs> I mean, pretty much, I dare you to be in there when they balance this budget. Do you know where that money is going? But let's be realistic, we don't even know what's in his pie. So, I mean, I mean really, come on. So it makes no sense to believe that California is actually going to use these money for schools when we know that they can't balance this budget, and we know that we've already seen them cut money from schools. I mean, the teachers recently have gotten an 8% cut in just their own pay, so how are they supposed to be able to teach people if, you know, there's no money for it? So you're definitely going to vote for an AMT team because we've already told you that fourth graders are selling this pot to their friends, not even knowing that it's pot. So, I mean, I mean, you don't want that to happen to your own kids, do you? No. So that's why you're voting for So that's actually not a good number. Um, so for those reasons, the affirmative, or sorry, the negative didn't actually attack much of the advantage that I laid out, and they also didn't defend their advantage very well either. All they simply said is, yes, it is a scare tactic, which basically just proves my point saying that it's not actually valid, it's just a scare tactic. So for that reason, uh, the, the disadvantage being a scare tactic, and my, uh, my advantage completely going untouched, you're going to be voting for the affirmative today. Thank you.
Yeah, uh, what you'll do, um, probably, here, let me stop this. 